Obviously, you could cover it in one, but it's just too important uh, to rush through it, especially this time of the year. It fits well uh, as well. So tonight we'll look at, and here's the outline if you like to take notes or just need an idea of where we're going. So we'll look at verses 26 through 31, which is on the way to Gethsemane. So we'll pick up where we left off last week, where we were able to observe communion. We looked at that, the institution of the Lord's Supper, had the last Passover meal and those sorts of things. They leave the upper room and Jesus takes the disciples and they make their way to Gethsemane. That's 26 through 31. And then in verses 32 and 34, you see where Jesus begins to pray. And although he has his disciples, and even though the disciples to some degree are close by, one of the things I'll draw your attention to is Jesus suffers alone largely. I mean, they're there, but not really. More on that really next week, but we'll see a little bit of that tonight. But then finally, and this is partly why I don't want to do this so quickly and doing it in two parts, is I really want you to notice in particular verses 35 through 36, and it's quite frankly the wrath and the will of God, because that's what it is. It is Jesus taking upon himself, in other words, it's the beginning of it, and it's God's wrath. And if you want to say it more clearly, it is that Jesus is going to take his your sins upon himself and he begins to know what that is going to entail so obviously very fitting for this time of the year uh, but it's important for us to understand what in fact is going on there in Gethsemane because if you will it's the starting point of course to the hours that would come where he will hang on the cross for the sins of the world but let's just read the passage we'll read it in its entirety it's not particularly long Uh, And then we'll look at the uh, three sections that I have outlined. So let's just read it, beginning in verse 26. This is right where we left off last week. Mark, again, is kind of abrupt, which no surprise. He tends to be sometimes. Mark is very abrupt. They have the Lord's Supper, as we think of it, communion. We saw that last week, or the institution thereof. And then they leave. Okay, So just in your mind, see, there's a bit of an abruptness here. So let's pick up in verse 26. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, You yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying incessantly, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And we'll conclude, Lord willing, next week, the rest of this. Now, you've been with us, obviously, you know where we're at, more or less. We are in the latter stage. I mean, quite frankly, in the latter days, in the latter hours, in this case tonight, uh, we are in the servant's suffering, which picks up in Mark chapter 11. I thought this might be easier for us to follow over the next several messages until we finish Mark. Uh, And essentially, this is just a broad overview of the week of passion or whatever you want to call it. So if you remember, the base core events in Mark are the triumphal entry is the trigger, if you will. That's what we think of. And then some high level things. Of course, Jesus cleanses the temple. We have the Olivet Discourse traditionally taught on Tuesday. I mean, that's when Jesus gives it, and I think that's correct. Wednesday is somewhat strange. When I say strange, is the, the scripture is largely silent 
We don't really know what he does and what he doesn't do on it. Uh, the general thought is he's probably in Bethany or something like that. We just don't have very much. It's Wednesday's somewhat silent. It's the calm before the storm. Because if you notice what happens on Thursday, well, Thursday evening is what we saw last time. And these are high-level points, obviously. We see where, of course, you have the Last Supper or the institution of the Lord's Supper. So just in your mind, remember, we move from Thursday evening, Thursday night, into the early hour morning, that window of time, where, of course, on Friday you will have the, dare I say, corrupt trial followed by the crucifixion. Okay? So just have in your mind here, we're in these last hours here. I take Gethsemane to overlap Thursday night on into the early morning hours of Friday, but neither here nor there. So if you notice, after the Passover meal, Jesus leads the disciples from Jerusalem to Gethsemane, and he's making his way, and he sings hymns, and we don't know what those are, do we? Well, not exactly that we can confirm with certainty, but tradition is that these are the Hallel Psalms. The Hallel Psalms are probably some of the most beautiful psalms to read at Easter time. This is Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. I want to give you this as just an example. Let's look at these two. So turn with me to Psalm 116. I would encourage you, if you want something different to read during Easter, um, you could read all of them, but in particular, Psalms 115 through Psalm 118, those are the ones that Jews sang after the Passover meal. Now, where were we looking at last week? The Passover meal. Jesus concludes the Passover meal. They leave Jerusalem. They make their way to Gethsemane. And Jesus is going to die a cruel death, yet he sings for joy. I don't think we would do that, would we? So keep in mind while we read these that Jesus, again, is fully aware of all which is going on. Yet he, of course, shows his trust in God. And I'm just going to give you a sample of these. Let's read Psalm 116 first. Uh, obviously not the whole thing. I just picked out three verses. We're going to read verses 3 through 4 and then verse 9. And I only just want you to conceptualize Psalm 115 through 118 are psalms that the Jews traditionally sang after Passover meal. So the probability is really high this is what Jesus would have been singing. So if he was, and I say if he was, just imagine him singing this. And this is just a sample. Let's read verses 3 and 4 and verse 9 of Psalm 116. The cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol, that's death, come upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Verse 9, I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Jesus isn't afraid of death because he knows he will triumph over the grave through, of course, God himself. Psalm 118, for, for instance, is the last of the Hallel Psalms and it's a psalm of thanksgiving. I cannot imagine singing a song of thanksgiving on my way to death, could you? So again, Jesus is fully aware of what's going to go on, but he's also aware that he's going to rise again. And these are just a sample. We'll read, read verse 5 and verse 22. Verse 5 says, my for my, From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Notice verse 22. This one's used in the New Testament quite often. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So Jesus, very likely, but either case, was singing songs on the way to his death. It's quite amazing, isn't it? So the shadow of the cross didn't remove the Lord's joy. What is joy? I told you, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is inner tranquility. It is joyousness. What? Regardless of what's going on around us. Jesus is picturing that here because he's singing songs of praise Yet he's going to the cross. Now, if you go back to Mark, Mark chapter 13 or 14, where we were, rather, you'll notice verse 27. So they leave, they sing, and these are probably likely the traditional songs that would have been sung. 
They make their way to the Mount of Olives, but you'll notice verse 27, and Jesus says, you're going to all fall away. Now stop and think for a second. Jesus knows that he's not only going to suffer on the cross, he also knows that Judas is going to betray him, and he knows the 11 remaining disciples are going to flee from him. You talk about abandonment and alonement. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He even knows that they're going to do this. Yet Jesus knows that in the end, of course, that won't be the end. Uh, if you notice, he says in there, you're going to all fall away. In the Greek, it gives the idea here to have a lapse of faith. All 11 of them have a lapse of faith to vary degrees. Peter being the one that we, of course, see as the strong, but of course, it's not permanent either. It's not a permanent undoing of, of course, all that he has done for them. I want you to look with me real quick and then we'll move on. Uh, John 16, 32 here. I want you to see this again. Just from a different perspective, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptics, so there is a lot of similarity. But I just want you to consider something, and this is John 16, and this is the same proximity of time. This is Thursday night in the upper room discourse. But in John 16, 32, Jesus says something similar, but you get a little bit of extra detail, detail here, which is this. Jesus wasn't actually completely alone, although everyone else had abandoned him. Notice verse 32. Behold, an hour is coming and has yet already come. For you to be scattered, notice the similarities there, but notice this, each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus would be abandoned by every single person as he goes to the cross, yet the Father was with him. Uh, the Father was with him during that time. And you and I can never, ever suffer abandonment like Jesus, but you and I are never alone. You understand? God is always with us. And even if you feel alone, that isn't the case. Jesus was completely abandoned by everyone, yet the Father was always there. Now before we move on here, there's two things I want you to notice, which is what I call a prelude to Peter's fall. Peter is going to fall, and of course the Lord, as I mentioned this morning, will restore him. You get a glimpse of it here, and then we're going to have a whole message on it, Lord willing... One day when I get to it in a few weeks. But I want you to notice the glimpse of it here. Because there's a lesson here and then Peter has to learn before he can serve. Because Peter isn't ready to serve the Lord yet. <clears throat> notice in the passage where I read. Notice verse 29 through 31. What does Peter say? Everyone else may abandon you, but I'll even go to death for you. Peter will proverbially eat his words in a few hours. It won't be long. And a couple of things I'll just go ahead and mention to you. Peter thought that he could suffer persecution. Peter thought that he could do and serve the Lord in his own strength. And before he could serve the Lord, you know what the Lord's going to do to him? Completely crush him. You know why? Because Peter couldn't serve in the role he was going to until he learned that the Lord was the only one who could give him the strength to do what he needs to do. Peter didn't have the strength on his own to serve the Lord. A very simple way to remember Peter is this way. Peter would learn that he couldn't, but the Lord could. He can't serve on his own, and so what God is going to do is he's going to crush him, and then all that he will have left is God. And God will, of course, strengthen him. Now, is Peter able to stand after or before he's crushed? After. Because see, Peter will spend the rest of his life suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. But a wee little girl comes and makes him afraid. So just remember that as well. So Peter was going to need to be broken and to rely on the Lord's strength. And if that's not a message, I don't know what is. Because we oftentimes think we can serve the Lord on our own strength, don't we? But we can't. Now, I've mentioned to you one last thing, and then we'll move on to Gethsemane. You'll notice there, once again, Jesus says in verse 28, after I've been raised. Do you notice once again? It's no different than the weeks before, the days before, the hours before. The cross and the grave are not the end. Jesus knows that he's going to die, yet he's going to rise again. 
I'll mention this to you because there is a lot of critics of the Bible and of Christianity, and they say this was some concocted myth after the resurrection. The problem with that argument is that Jesus proclaims before his death, I would rise again, and it's flooded in the New Testament. You go through the Gospels, all four of them, and Jesus almost goes to the cross knowing, I'm going to rise again. It's not a question of whether I will. It's divine fiat that he's going to rise again. He says, after I rise again, go to Galilee, because that's where you'll find me. And my friends, if you go and read the post-resurrection accounts, do you know what happens? They find him in Galilee, and that's where they go find him. Why is that? Because they learn that Jesus, when he speaks, it's going to happen, and it is true. Jesus knows he's not only going to suffer, but he's going to rise again. Why is it? Because there's hope beyond the cross. Jesus is not like all of the false religions in the world. Jesus Christ, biblically, is the only one who rose again. All others are dead in the grave. What sets Christianity apart is not simply the cross, but the empty tomb, my friends. And Jesus knew all along what was going to happen. So as we pick up here, Jesus arrives in verse 32, where? In Gethsemane. And so if you're curious where this is, this is all in that same proximity here. So Jesus leaves somewhere in that pinkish area, if you will. He makes his way toward, of course, he's going there towards the Mount of Olives, and uh, he ends up there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I, and I mentioned this to you, this is all familiar territory. So the disciples wouldn't have been thinking, why in the world is he going here? Why is he going this way? This is all of these sort of general routes that Jesus takes. Now, the Mount of Olives here, this is a picture, if you will, facing it. And this is on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Uh, beloved, I will tell you, this is the same place that Jesus is going to return. And when he returns, I told you there'll be no mistake in that day that he's Lord. You know why? Because it's going to split in two. And right now it's in one piece. We also know what Gethsemane looks like, at least to some degree. Now, you can avoid, if you notice in the far left, it almost ruins the picture. It's a modern day church. It looks almost like a hotel I can tell you it wasn't there when Jesus was, and it probably wasn't as, uh, if you will, landscaped quite as well, uh, but uh, here it is, and uh, imagine Jesus going there. And we shouldn't be surprised that the Mount of Olives, what is significant about the Mount of Olives? Well, a couple of things, one of which is the Olivet Discourse, that's where we talked about, that is the name where it comes from. Jesus ascends from where? The Mount of Olives. Where does he come back in triumphal power? The Mount of Olives. And he's going to split them in two. Now Gethsemane, if you're not familiar with it again, it's on that slope area that I showed you in the original picture. And Jesus would go there often, so it wouldn't have necessarily caught the disciples off guard. And I gave you just two references. Now I say this cautiously because... You can kind of get where I'm going with this in a second, not so much the first one. Gethsemane means an oil press, but more specifically, it is the place where olives were crushed. And Jesus is going to begin to be crushed. Do you understand the imagery there? My friends, Jesus doesn't go there and just pray and they're all hanging out. Jesus is getting ready to bear the sins. In other words, this idea of God's wrath is going to come upon him. And so Jesus goes there. Now, of course, he has the 12 with him. And then he narrows down, if you notice what's happening here. Jesus goes into Gethsemane. If you've ever seen the paintings where all of them are gathered around, it's not quite right. And I'm not being critical. I mean, how do you put all these people in one painting? Okay, I know that. But the idea is Jesus goes in and he has this, well, what would be 11, really. And of the 12 disciples, he has his three, you remember? Who are the prominent ones? Peter, James, and John. I tell you, you got to love them because can you imagine some of the things that they got to encounter that the others didn't? They are the ones who got right up close to where Jesus is in the Holy of Holies, if you will, and he's praying to the Father. They also were the ones who got to see what else? In case you're wondering, the answers to the quiz is up there. It's transfiguration. 
mean, they got to see all these things, and yet what do they do? They still fall away. And Jesus, though, in a sense, though, don't forget, has to do some of this alone. I think it's fascinating because in Gethsemane you see the humanity of Jesus, perhaps, almost like in his temptation, very clearly, don't you? You see where Jesus has this great agony. And if you've ever heard about the bleeding of blood, I mean, Jesus is, if you will, seen here in his great humanity. He wants closeness of people around him, yet Jesus has to suffer alone. This wasn't something that anybody else could help, if you will, bear with him. What is Jesus know, What does he know is coming? Well, John 15, 13, he's going to lay down his life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he's going to become sin. He's going to, if you will, impute all of the sin upon himself. All of the sin that you have committed. If you are the only one to have ever lived, all of your sin is going to dump and pour like an empty cup all over Jesus Christ. He's going to bear all of it for you. And so he knows what's coming. And I put up Galatians 3.13. What is Galatians 3.13? He's going to bear the curse of the law. Jesus is not willy-nilly going there and simply praying. He's going to suffer and suffer greatly. Notice the glimpse of the humanity of Jesus. Whoops, sorry. Uh, you see there where it says that he suffered, of course, exceedingly. And he knew all these things were going to happen. Let me read this to you there. Um, it says that the prospect of bearing God's wrath for the world's sins and experiencing separation from his Father grieved Jesus deeply. This was much more than a mere martyr has ever had to endure. In times of trouble, what should we take from this lesson? Not much, because you and I can't do this. But in times of great sorrow and difficulty, we pray. Jesus went to the Father in prayer. Why is that? He seeks strength. I think He seeks comfort from the Father. He seeks strength. And you and I need to do the same thing. I'm not much one on personal application for Gethsemane because there's quite frankly not really any of it because Jesus is bearing something that is there that only he can, of course, do. But let's pick up here, and this is verses 35 through 36, and this is the hard part. And this is why I in many ways want to dwell on this and not just go in and have one message on Gethsemane. You'll notice that Jesus, of course, in verse 34, it says his soul is grieved deeply. He sees himself at the point of death. He tells them to remain there and watch. We'll, we'll see their failing next week. But I want to notice you to notice here verses 35 through 36 because this is so important to understand Gethsemane. If you don't grasp these things, you really aren't ever going to understand what it's going on here. Notice what it says. He went a little beyond them. He goes in. He has his disciples. He tells the main ones, if you will, if you will, to stay there, the general ones, if you will. He takes the three a little closer into the garden, and then he tells them to stay, and he goes beyond there, because Jesus has to do and endure this alone. Okay? Now, he goes there, and when he enters in, it says, and he falls to the ground, and he begins to pray if there was some way possible, because his hour had come. The hour for Jesus theologically is imperative because if you grasp this, you'll see where Jesus was going to overcome everything, every obstacle during his ministry. In the Gospel of John, and I give these to you because they're very important. In John chapter 2, verse 4, his hour hadn't come. John chapter 7, verse 30, his hour hadn't come. Chapter 8, verse 20, his hour hadn't come. Chapter 12, verse 23, his hour hadn't come. Chapter 12, verse 27, his hour hadn't come. Jesus had all the obstacles of all the religious leaders, and they could not move forward God's timetable. And then in John 13, everything changes. What does it say? Well, what it says is essentially this. Jesus having that his hour had come, 
having to part, of course, getting ready to out of the world. He loved his disciples to the end. The hour is the time in which Jesus will fulfill the Father's eternal plan for redemption. Everything was on God's timetable. And when the time came, it was going to be fulfilled. Not an hour, if you will, early, not an hour late. It was going to take place. And what does that show? It shows everything with that Easter resurrection week was in God's control, control in His timetable. You ever wondered what the cup was? The cup is simply this. It's a picture of God's judgment and His wrath, and it's nothing else more than that. I have seen people try to soften this, and my friends, there's no way to soften it. It is the wrath of Yahweh upon someone or something. Let me give you a few examples of this. Of course, we won't read all of these. Psalm 75, verse 8. Isaiah 51, 17. Isaiah 51, 22. Let's turn to Jeremiah 25, 15. <clears throat> because there's really no way to soften this. And I think it's important sometimes for us to remember that Jesus' hour was the time where he's going to take on and fulfill God's eternal redemptive plan, everything lining up just as God said. But when Jesus talks about this cup passing, what is he talking about? He's talking about God Almighty's judgment and wrath being poured out on the second person of the Trinity. Now, let's look at Jeremiah 25, verse 15, and you get an example. And the others that I give you are, are some, essentially the same, meaning they show the same thing. But let's just read this and notice what it says. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations whom I send to you to drink it. The idea there is that God's judgment and His wrath coming upon the nations. Instead, in Gethsemane, all of God's judgment, all of His wrath related to the sins of the world are being, if you will, proverbially dumped and poured on Jesus Christ. So when Jesus goes to the cross, it's no wonder He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's no wonder he has all the agony in Gethsemane, the same that he has on the cross, because Jesus is bearing and taking upon himself God's wrath that you should be taking. You should have actually assumed God's wrath. Jesus, if you will, intervenes in that wrath. If you ever notice in the New Testament, whenever the expression is to take upon something, Jesus is taking upon God's wrath in your place. And he is bearing that. Now, you'll see back in Mark what Jesus says. So he falls to the ground, and he knows that the time has come. And what does he do? He cries out. You recognize this from our study in Galatians. Abba. You see the intimacy here within the Godhead and Jesus there in Gethsemane says, Father, anything is possible from you. Notice, remove your wrath from me. But don't do what I wish. Fulfill your will. In other words, I will take the wrath because of why. Why does Jesus take upon God's wrath? It's really not that hard to figure out. Jesus didn't want to in the sense of, I mean, who in the world would want to be separated? Yet he was willing. It's a picture of submission. What Jesus does is he prays and then he leaves it to God. The idea here is that if there was another way for man to be saved, God would have done it because he wouldn't have had his son go on the cross. But clearly there wasn't. It was only Christ, and it was only Christ alone which salvation would come through. Let me read this to you. I think it's helpful here. And it helps us understand this image of Jesus where he says, Father, I don't want to be separated. I don't want to have that wrath because that wrath separates me from you. Yet I'll take it because there is no other way to save fallen man. Notice what this says, and I think this is helpful. 
Could the Almighty Father find any other righteous basis upon which He could save ungodly sinners? The silent heavens indicated that there was no other way. The Holy Son of God must bleed that sinners might be freed from sin. Do you see what's going on here? Jesus, in effect, says, if there was any way that I wouldn't have to bear the wrath, because I know when I'm on that cross, it's going to be me who says, of course, my God, my God, why hast thou turned thou back on thy son? It's because Jesus has sin, and that sin is Pastor Stevens. It's every sin of the world is being poured on Jesus, but yet Jesus says, I'll take it because man can't save himself any other way. If there was ever an argument for the exclusivity of Jesus Christ in the cross, my friends, this is it. There is no other way for man to be saved except for Jesus to drink the wrath of God. Because man can't drink wrath upon himself and endure it. And so when Jesus hangs on that cross, he's bearing all of that wrath upon himself, which you should be judged for. So when does Jesus' suffering begin? The cross or Gethsemane? It's Gethsemane without any doubt. It's no wonder he sweats blood because he knows what's coming. For all of eternity, Jesus was in perfect union and harmony with the Father... Yet when he's on the cross, there'll be a brief glimpse of separation, which I have no idea what that is like. And he did it because of you and me, because our sins are the ones that nailed him to the cross. Jesus in Gethsemane is taking on God's wrath to judge the world for sin and unrighteousness. Lord, never let my heart forget that midnight in Gethsemane, when all Pastor Stephen's guilt, grief, and debt were by thy Father laid on thee. Do you understand? That's what Jesus is going through in Gethsemane. The only personal application is, thank you, Jesus, for taking that in my place. Our Father in heaven... I thank you for the passages in Scripture that are difficult because, Father, I can't fully fathom how the second person of the Trinity can take on flesh and dwell among humanity and then humble himself by being obedient, by being obedient to the point of death on the cross. And when he went to the cross, he was bearing your wrath that I should have taken. Father, I pray that we not come and approach the week of the crucifixion and the resurrection lightly like we, e- we easily could. When we remember Gethsemane, we remember what's happening. All of my guilt, all of my grief, all of my sin, all of my shame, everything was laid upon Christ because there was no other way to sin- save sinful man. Father, never let us forget what was happening there and who bore our sins that we could never pay. Father, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen.